Well, these objects kept coming over at the flying the same kind of formation that we fly in our fighters. Where were you flying? We were flying in Germany, and we were flying F-86s. And they would come over and do the same maneuvers that we make, except every once in a while one of them would go zip. And you just can't do that in a fighter, it's a conventional fighter. Well, yeah, they weren't just random. They were flying, uh, they were flying fighter formations, very definitely under positive control. They're just typical uh, saucer shape, double lenticular shape, metallic looking. I think they were definitely piloted vehicles, each one with the pilot in it, and very definitely in communication with one another, because they would have flights of more than and four, they'd have flights of maybe 12 or 16, all across, and when they'd make a turn, they'd cross the flights in under, and they had to be in communication. To... But this time, I was involved in the research and development and doing very classified programs myself, you know, at the test center. So I knew that we didn't have any vehicles of that kind, and I was 99 or 9 sure that the Russians didn't have any of that type either. So it certainly, there were certainly was, at that point in time, there was no doubt in my mind that this vehicle was uh, made at some other place than here on Earth. And in my opinion, I think they were worried that it would panic the public if they knew that someone had vehicles that had this kind of performance way back, right after World War II, a period of time. So they started telling lies about it. And then I think they had to cover another lie, you know, tell another lie to cover their first lie, and now they don't know how to get out of it. Now it's going to be so embarrassing to admit that all these administrations have, uh, have told a lot of untruths that it's going to be embarrassing to get out of it. Six years later, Cooper again encountered a UFO. This one definitely was not a weather balloon. While supervising flight testing in Edwards Air Force Base, his military camera crew actually filmed an unidentified saucer-shaped object landing near the site. As they were sitting there filming, a little saucer came from, uh, I say little saucer, it was a saucer, came flying over their heads, put down three little landing gear and landed right out on the dry lake bed. And they picked up their cameras and started over toward it, filming as they went. And when they got in fairly close to it, it lifted up, put the gear back in the wheel wells, tipped up, and took off at a great rate of speed. And so they brought the, came into my office and told me what had happened, and I sent them over to develop the film, and then had to go through the, all the proper regulations of reporting this. And, and we wound up having to send the film forward to Washington in the uh, base jet airplane. and. Uh, I don't know whether anyone's ever seen it since. Now, the vehicle that you just described, how similar was it to the very first sighting that you had back in 1951? Quite similar. It was basically the same plan form vehicle. They were a double saucer, lenticular. But if you're going to be going in and out of atmospheres like Earth or other places might have, you certainly need a little more aerodynamic type of vehicle and the saucer has the capability of going through the air at tremendous rates of speed and handling the bow and trailing wave without making shock waves. So it can be very silent while traveling at big rates of speed through the atmosphere. But sightings of UFOs weren't limited to the military. Cooper has commercial airline colleagues who've also seen UFOs. He has a friend of mine who's a captain on a major airline. Uh, at night, was flying along, noticed this, suddenly a big glow came off his left wing and and he looked out and his big saucer was sitting right off their wing. And so he turned slide toward and it moved away and turned back and it moved back in position and turned to his co-pilot and said, uh, do you see what I see? And he said, oh God, yeah, I do. And it trailed along with him for quite a period of time and tipped up and climbed very steeply away. Years later, Cooper approached the United Nations with a proposal for a committee that would explore the UFO phenomenon. Right now, tell me about the letter to the UN. Well, the letter to the UN was uh, in conjunction with a meeting that I had with uh, Kurt Waldheim and the Security Council of the UN to try to encourage the UN to establish a committee to start comparing notes and data and information and to really look into all of this from an unbiased, neutral point of view. 
Here's a quote from, from your letter. I believe that these extraterrestrial vehicles and their crews are visiting this planet from other planets and are obviously a little more advanced than we are here on Earth. And are you saying that's exactly why governments have been trying to keep this information private because of that obvious advancement? Very possibly, right.